reclaiming first love. Reclaiming first love. I want to read to you the entire message to the church at Ephesus, beginning at verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith of the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Our Father, help me today. Uh, Lord, you know that I cannot do this without your help. I would ask, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit, that I might be the preacher teacher that I need to be. And I pray, Father, that you would put a guard at my lips. That, uh, Lord, I would not only say the things I shouldn't say, but, Lord, have that holy boldness to speak the things that are true. Father, I pray this morning that you'd speak to all of us. Uh, Lord, help us to realize, first of all, how easy it is to become cold. Uh, help us, I pray, Father, not to be cold. Help us to be zealous of good works. Uh, help us, I pray, to be excited about serving you. To be excited about coming to church. To be excited about being able to reach out some lost person. To be excited about coming into your presence to pray. Father, to, to be excited about being a Christian. And Lord, have that gratitude and that freshness about us every day as we get up and go. And Father, I pray today that you might get the glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> the church at Ephesus. Let me lay some groundwork here uh, before we uh, speak about some things that we need to speak about today. The church at Ephesus had already had a long Christian witness. Paul had ministered to the church for three years. The church at the time of God's word to it here in the book of Revelation was still laboring for the Lord. They could not bear those who were evil, meaning they could not and would not tolerate wickedness inside the church or out for that matter. False apostles and false teachers were seen for who they were, and the church denounced them. This church was still a biblically sound church. But it had a problem that without soon being addressed would lead to an, either, to an even bigger problem in the years ahead. No church, let me say this because sometimes people make certain statements that are not true. No church immediately abandons the faith. It's a process. There is a progression that, if allowed, leads the church downhill spiritually. The starting point is the loss of first love. As we shall point out later, this church's devotion to Christ had now diminished. 
soon its influence in the community would also begin to diminish. One of the things that Jesus often addressed is the subject of love. You, you cannot read the Bible, folks. You cannot read the Gospels without Jesus speaking about the subject of love. And it's in all four of the Gospels, not just one or two of them. Now, he taught that keeping his commandments, living in obedience to him, requires loving him with all you have. Yes. Serving Christ to full capacity requires loving him above everyone else and everything else. But one of the things where Christians often grow cold is in this area of love for him. Now, there are actually three points today. I went a step further than I normally do. Normally I feel like two points is enough, but for some reason today I felt like three was necessary. Now, you'll understand why. First of all, here's the first point. In the message to the church at Ephesus, our Lord first commended the church for its good works. Now, let me make a statement here that uh, is emphatic. No church of His should ever have anything less than good works. Now, watch this. The degree of good works that a church has. We're talking about local church, but it would, uh, the, the, the whole church as a whole would also be reflected this way. The degree that a church has of good works has to do with a degree of good works its members practice. A church is made up of many members, Paul reminds us there in the book of Corinthians. Now, watch this. Good works never saves anyone. We read in Ephesians 2, 9, not of works lest any man should boast. Salvation is by grace, grace through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. He or she who would be saved believes on Jesus Christ. The Philippian ruler, the jailer, excuse me, the Philippian jailer asked uh, Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And their response was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. They placed their faith in Christ, what Christ did for them on the cross. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Look at Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Wonderful verses. Sometimes we more particularly uh, use these verses at Christmas time. But you know what? I don't think God ever intended for them to be used just at Christmas time. But Galatians 4, 4 and 5 really speak about how it is that you and I can become a Christian. It says, when, when the fullness of time was come, uh, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday school this morning. Jesus Christ took our place on the cross, under the law, to fulfill for us the privilege of being able to be saved. Uh, you and I are saved by grace, not by works. Jesus Christ shed blood on the cross was the payment made that we might have the forgiveness of sins. In essence, Jesus died so that we could live. The greatest thing in the world that you can ever have is eternal life. 
God sent the most precious thing He had, His Son Jesus, into the world to provide for you and I the most precious thing of all, eternal life. If you don't think eternal life is the most precious thing of all, there's surely something wrong with you. You're going to leave. You're going to leave this world. I get amazed sometimes at people that leave this world so young. Alice was telling me the other day about some lady that she knew, and I knew vaguely, I didn't know her real well. Uh, but she said uh, uh, she died, she got cancer. And I said, How old was she? She said, She's 56. I said, man, to me that's young. Now, I don't know what that means to you guys. But 56 is young. Uh, some of you are not at 56 yet, right? Don't worry, you get there soon enough. <laughs> now, 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 watch this because we, we need to understand this. Jesus Christ was born under the law for the reason of fulfilling the law. Jesus Christ was absolutely perfect. He was the Son of God as well as the Son of Man. He was born under that law so that He could fulfill it for every one of us. And we have the privilege, I want you to notice that in verse 5, we have the privilege of being one of God's children. He says this, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Listen folks, I'm so glad God adopted me. Yes. I'm so glad this morning that I can say, without reservation, I'm one of His children. Yes, amen. Now, I'm sometimes kind of like one of my children. What does that mean? God has to get after me. But I'm glad He gets after me. Yes. Because He keeps me from going to the place where I do something ridiculously wrong with my life. Yes, sir. Now, watch this. They know that by His shed blood, they have the remission of sins, that is, those who have trusted Christ. Good works, however, are evidence of true saving faith. Look at James chapter 2. And verses 14 through 17. I have told you uh, from time to time, haven't said it for a while, but James was one of the last books to be accepted into the canon of Scripture because there were uh, some who at the first, as they looked at this book, misread it and misunderstood. Let me just say this, because... Why, preacher? Because some people use this book to teach that you have to live a good life to get to heaven, and this book doesn't teach that. There's no place in Scripture. Listen, Scripture never contradicts itself. When it says, not of works, that's any man should boast, that's what it means. But what James is doing here is something that needs to be done today. There are people today who claim they are saved. But there's no proof of it. You don't see them living for God. You don't see them witnesses. In fact, when it comes time for somebody to kind of talk to them a little bit about Scripture, they turn a deaf ear. Look what James says, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, uh, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. And so a person who has true saving faith, confirms that fact that she or he is truly saved by the fact that they serve the Lord. Listen, when I got saved, nobody told me I had to serve the Lord. Not I had some religion. But I really didn't know what it meant to be saved. 
But we serve Christ out of gratitude, really. I was so overwhelmed the night I got saved. Now watch this. Watch this. <coughs> Concerning someone who is really saved. To take an active role in the church. They witness for him making every effort to reach some lost person. There are people who look out for one another. Why does James use this little uh, illustration here in uh, 15, 16, and 17? Uh, notice he says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you saying to them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what do they profit? You know, the early church, if you uh, look at it back there uh, in the second chapter of the book of Acts, uh, one of the things that they did, many of them in that day, because uh, salvation uh, for many meant loss of job. Persecution was a, an unbearable uh, thing, and yet uh, God helps us to bear up with it, and sometimes by way of other Christians. But can you imagine a person coming to you and saying, I'm hungry. And your response was, have a good day. Make sure you feel like your belly's filled. Are you joking? You know what? You'd look like an idiot saying that. One thing about a person who truly walks with the Lord is they have compassion on their brothers and sisters in Christ. And if that's not there, let me tell you something, there's something wrong. <coughs> now, watch this. Watch this. I don't want to labor so long in one place because I've got other areas where I need to labor. Watch this. Sadly, so many people who claim to be saved are not <coughs> and will not hear Jesus' words and if they're not careful, are forever in a place of iniquity to die without Christ. Their so-called belief is nothing more than what the devil believes about Christ. Now, I have some things that I want to show you here, uh, here in the book of James concerning uh, uh, verses 18 and 19. Let me read verses 18 and 19 to you uh, because it just makes so much good sense. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But now, notice this. Their so-called belief is nothing more than what the devil believes about Christ. But notice that while the devils believe, they also tremble. Let me tell you why. Even the fallen angels affirm the oneness of God and tremble at its implications. What implication? What has God already done? He's already judged the devil. It's only a matter of time. The devil and all of his angels, that's why they use the plurality of devils here instead of just devil. They've already been condemned to the lake of fire. It's just a matter of time. But watch this. And I never thought about this before, but it does make sense. Demons are essentially orthodox. What does that mean? Well, the word orthodox means sound or correct in opinion or doctrine. It means they know the truth about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They know it. Orthodox by itself, listen very carefully, is no proof of saving faith. 
I told you this early this morning in the Sunday school class about my, my son's father-in-law. He can quote scripture. First time he got out of the car, we had a wedding practice. First time he got out of the car out here, I remember it just like it was yesterday, and that was what, uh, James will be soon, soon be 16, so time flies, doesn't it? But the first thing he got out of the car, he had to quote scripture to me. I don't know what that was about. I just ignored it. Maybe he wouldn't let me know he knew something. You know, a lot of people know just enough to be spiritually dead. They can quote the verses. I had a fellow aboard ship. He could quote goodly portions of the Bible. Let me tell you something. The life he lived was not the life of a Christian. Now watch this. Many, many people today are orthodox. But they've never been saved. All who have been saved, watch this, were purposed by God to produce good works. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and let's look at that verse that sometimes is ignored. You know, we like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but sometimes we forget verse 10. In verse 10 we read this, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, we who are saved are His workmanship. It was God working in us that brought us to the place where we are. Uh, you and I, if the Holy Spirit of God hadn't have brought to us that divine understanding of Scriptures, we'd be as blind and dead this morning as we ever were when we were born. We are God-empowered that we might produce fruits and evidence of salvation. Look at John 15, 8. John 15, 8. And I turn to Luke. I'm getting old. Verse 8. I wonder why it didn't show up right on the right page. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciple. You know, if you're a true disciple of Christ, you bring forth fruit. You know, uh, the book of, uh, of John 15 is fruit, much fruit, and more fruit. If you know anything about a farmer, you know a lot of the terms that the Bible uses has to do with agriculture. If you know anything about a farmer, he's not satisfied uh, with the produce that he got this year. He wants to do better next year. Yes. And that's just, that's just good sense. Why, why would you not want to do that? Uh, why not uh, set goals? And uh, after all, uh, when it's all said and done, the bill's got to be paid, don't we? So, uh, if you have a year where you just break even, let me tell you something, that's not so good. God doesn't want to just break even. He wants more fruit. Hey, watch this. When, thing, when it says in Ephesians 2.10, which God has before ordained, those words are expressing the fact that like His salvation, a believer's sanctification and good works were ordained before time began. That's hard for you and I to understand. You know, we read in Scripture that uh, uh, God knew Jeremiah before he was in his mother's womb. Doesn't that blow your mind? And I meet so many parents that they can't hardly wait. Now some of them, uh, my wife on the last one, she decided... She didn't want to have that image, that picture, you know. And so she told everybody, going to be a girl. So we stayed up that night before she went to the hospital. Don't want to sing over, but anyway. she's not here, so you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so so we, we got up and, and we, we paint this room for a girl. Well, at 10.30 the next morning, it wasn't a girl. <laughs> Now when they wheeled her down, she said, listen, I've already got the name. 
That name didn't work so well. That's how we end up with Stephen. Let me tell you something, there's nothing about him that's a girl, is there? <laughs> nothing about him that's a girl, I can tell you. We had the privilege of seeing him yesterday. We got a surprise. We, got, we really got treated the last two days. I can't tell you how much. But we'd been taken out to eat by Alice's two brothers and their wives. And we were sitting there in the restaurant at Brookside. And in walks this guy with that mask on, you know. Everybody's got to have a mask on. But you know what? When it's your son, you can see him right off the bat. And I, both of us jumped up out of the seat because we haven't seen him in quite a while now. But you know what? Uh, and I got off track. I got to get back. Uh, let's, uh, let's understand something. That before time began, God established why? Because he's all-knowing. Yes. I don't want to be all-knowing, Trevor. I'd be scared to death if I was all-knowing. The all-knowing God not only planned for your salvation, Joe, but planned for what he wants you to do with your life. Yes. Now, sometimes it takes us a while to figure out what that is. Sometimes it's because of the culture we grew up in. And we're kind of bogged down with all kinds of thinking that really doesn't square with Scripture. But you know what? If you patiently wait on Him, He'll put you where He wants you to be. And He'll use you in a mighty way. But you have to be surrendered to that, folks. Now watch this. God already had His plans for you to serve Him in some capacity. Jesus finished the work He came to do before he left this world. Look at John 17, 4. John 17, 4. Just move over a little ways. He finished the work. John 17, we've always said this is really the Lord's Prayer. But he says in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Look at John 19, 30. John 19, 30. As he hung on the cross, he spoke these words. When therefore uh, uh, Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What did Jesus do? He finished the job that God called him to do when he came to this world the first time. Now, that's to be our mentality. We have a job to finish. I want you to look at what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. We've been talking about the fact, listen, that good works is what God expects of His church and of His people. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, uh, verses uh, 6 through 7, we read this. This is the Apostle Paul. He's just about ready to leave this world. For I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Look at me for a moment. Will you be able to say that when you die? You should be able to say that when you die. Yes. I finish what God called me to do. Now God doesn't call everybody to do the same thing, does He? Yeah. Praise God for that. Because we need different people doing different things. That's how the church is fulfilled in its capacity. Because you have different people being able to do different things. Now, that all said, that's the condemnation, com commendation. Now let's look at the condemnation. Number two, in the message to the church at Ephesus, our Lord gave them a strong rebuke. Let's look at those words one more time. I turn, if you will, to Revelation chapter 2. And begin at verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Now I like the fact that he doesn't say I have a whole lot against thee. He says I have somewhat. But the somewhat is very serious and you'll see why. Because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly 
and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. Let's understand something. Repentance is just not for lost people. And sometimes I think we think that. <clears throat> what is repentance? Repentance is a change of heart followed by a change of action. A repentant person acknowledges that the direction he's going is not right. Now, sometimes that's hard for Christians. It's hard for lost people for that matter. Repent. Why? Because it touches the subject of pride. Every one of us love to think, I am a great person. Really? Every time I look at Scripture, sometimes as I prepare these messages for you, I'm rebuked in, pre in pre preparation. Isn't that something? Watch this. We see in this passage, we see in this passage that He is warning them in the area of love. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Write this down. The word left implies intentional, not accidental. What, what do you mean? You mean they just had this, this arrogant way about them and they just said, you know what, God, I'm not going to do it anymore now? What it means is, in their heart, while they were losing the devotion, they were actually aware that it was happening. And they let it happen. That's kind of sad, isn't it? In other words, they knew that what was happening was not right. Now let me just share this with you because it ties in really easy here. Generally speaking, and we'll say it more in a minute. A person who loses their first love, the next step is the love of things. I wonder how many people, because of some thing that became so important, they had to have it. And in the process, went farther down the road of cooling off. How many of you in here can honestly say with me that there are times when you love things? The rest of you are a bunch of liars. <laughs> you going to tell me if I brought you some fancy thing that you've been longing after for a long while? Great preacher, I take it. Now you say to me, I want it. You know, I've discovered over the years that God has caused me to not have certain things I've asked for. My conclusion, best for me. Yes. Best for me. Watch this. They intentionally allowed it to happen. They knew in their heart what they were doing as they began to lose that love. When it says they left their first love, it means they had abandoned, please put this down and please grab hold of it, because we're going to talk about this for a moment. They abandoned their eagerness to please and devotion that characterizes first love. Isn't that something? Can a Christian do that? Well, he wouldn't be in here if he couldn't, right? Now, watch this. This church, more than 30 years before, had been commended for its love. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, please, verses 15 and 16. Or 15 and 16. Ephesians 1, 15 and 16. That's what he says here. The Apostle Paul uh, writing this letter uh, to the church at Ephesus. Verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You know why 
Paul prayed for him because Paul was aware of the fact that how easy it is for that which is good to be gone in a moment. Paul saw something great happening in the church. And he wanted to see it continue. He wanted to fan it. And so he says, I have given thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Watch this. <coughs> the same was said of the Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4. Colossians 1 and verse 4. We're making a point because we're going to show you something that's, that connects. Colossians 1 and verse 4. Uh, Since we heard of your faith in, in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. Now, put this down. Love for others is evidence of saving faith. Number one, please look at John 13, verses 34 and 35. John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Now, does that mean you can love some and, well, you know, I don't care for that person, don't have the right person, I forget it? I don't mean that. I'm certain that all of us in here today are people that sometimes are extremely unlovely. Don't look at me like that. It's true, isn't it? Yes. Have you ever had times when you thought the best thing for me to do is go someplace and be by myself? So, you like to shake his head. Uh-oh. <laughs> Getting down to the nitty-gritty here. I'm not the loveliest person. There are times in my life when I hate myself. Now watch this, because I, I need for you to get this. This is so important. Because watch this. But love for others is also evidence of loving God Himself. Please look at 1 John 4 and verse 20. 1 John 4 and verse 20. Look what he says here. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother. Well, I tell you, I think if we had John preaching here, he's kind of blunt sometimes, isn't he? How many of you like to be called a liar? Raise your hand. Here's what he says. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And so what we're to understand is at this church at Ephesus, their love for one another began to wane. And since their love for one another began to wane, so had their love for God began to wane. They have lost their first love. The church at Ephesus was experiencing a cooling off in their hearts. They were now, if they did not repent, headed down a road of further error. Their passion for Christ had begun to wane. Folks, listen. The Christian faith works through love. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 14. John's Gospel, chapter 14. I don't know what the time is and I don't care. I just hope you get the message. Okay? John 14, verse 21. Look what he says. John 14, 21. <laughs> he, that let has, he that has my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You know what? One of the greatest things that you and I can do with our life is live in accordance to the obedience of God's word. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus is to be loved above anyone or anything else. 
<clears throat> it will be the reason for taking up our cross and following him according to Matthew 10, 38. Taking up that cross means being willing to die for him. Listen to this and put it down and hold on to it forever. Until you're ready to die for him, you're not willing to live for him. Yes. And one of these days, we're going to find out what that means in the life of every one of us if the world continues the direction it's going. Jesus taught that the greatest commandment was loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37. He said, the second follows of thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40. You know, you're not ready to love anybody until you first love God. Until you learn how to love God, you husbands, you're not going to know how to love your wife. But let's just make it even here. Wives, until you learn to love God, you'll never know how to love your husband either. Now watch this. For every believer, there must be a passion for Christ. An eagerness and devotion to serve. A readiness to do His will. The Ephesian church had lost its devotion to Christ. That word devotion, that's an interesting word. It means dedications, consecration, earnest attachment. Do you know that a person that is devoted to God is referred to as devout? Do you know that sometimes there are lost people? Watch this. It seems a little more devout yes. than some Christians. Believers who are truly devoted to Christ have a, have a readiness, have a ready will to perform. Look at 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 11. A readiness to will and a performance out of it. And Corinthians 8.11 now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which he have. In this particular text, he's talking about giving. If a person is a believer, passionate about Christ, giving's not a problem. But here's the thing, the principle works through all the Christian life, not just about giving. What about how you live? That brings me to the last point. Third and final point. In the message to the church at Ephesus, our Lord called the church to repent. Look back at verse 5 one more time. Verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art falling and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. He told them to do the first works or else he would come and remove the candlestick. Removing the candlestick simply meant God's judgment would bring an end to the church. A lamp or a candlestick represents light. This church, if it did not repent and do the first works, would no longer have a place of spiritual influence in the community. How many churches today do you know that are dead? <clears throat> Beautiful on the outside, many of them. Hey, I love stained glass windows. I'm not opposed to it. If the church had the money and it wasn't a foolish thing to do, I like stained glass. You? Yes. Some of you decorate your home along, kind of along that line, some degree, I think. Mm -hmm. but, but here's the thing. They're beautiful on the outside and dead on the inside. Yes. Some of them have preachers. They're homosexuals. 
Some of them have preachers who couldn't preach if they tried. I told you about a church down in Smithfield for a long time that used to have a deacon from Demi Baptist Church come over and preach to them because they needed to be preached to. Their pastor could only read the scriptures he couldn't preach. Wow. That was a beautiful church on the outside. But a lot of its members were lost. Repentance is a change of heart followed by change of action. They were now told to do the first works. They were told, listen very carefully, to resume their former zeal and diligence. Watch, fast, pray, reprove sin, and carefully tend to all the ordinances of God. They were to walk in His Spirit. Our Lord wants us to be zealous about good works. Titus 2.14. I'm going to come to a close. Titus 2.14. Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself Kill your people. Zealous of good works. You know what the word peculiar means? You're special. You ever thought of yourself as being special to God? You are. You are. But here's the thing. God wants you to be zealous of good works. Not just producing good works. Excited about doing good works. So many people today are like the Jews. They have a knowledge of God and they're zealous. But beyond that, there's nothing. Are you zealous of good works? Close your Bibles and look at me for a moment. <clears throat> 